kicks off the episode here, we've got a very interesting piece. And this one, again, maybe not pertaining so much to Division Two or Division Three at the moment, but this was the first tweet that I saw about this new interesting issue, if you will. And it pertains to Dartmouth and their men's basketball team. Now, breaking the NLRB and... I need to pull up the actual article to tell you what exactly the hell that is. The National Labor Relations Board, obviously, Trev, uh, they ruled that the men's basketball players are employees of Dartmouth and are allowed to go forward with an an election, excuse me, to create a union. That's the that's the initial ruling. And so for the people that are listening, I've got a piece of some kind of legislation here in front of me. This is the tweet. If you're not seeing it, if you're listening. And it reads as follows. Dartmouth takes the position to be to. Oh, man, that's a tough start, Trev. Dartmouth takes the position the petition for basketball players are not employees within the meaning of the act and submits that the petition should be dismissed. In addition, Dartmouth takes the position that the board should decline to assert jurisdiction over the basketball players so as not to create instability in labor relations. But that's Dartmouth saying, this is bullshit. You can't agree to this. Yeah, yeah, Please yeah. don't let this happen or we are in trouble. Then it says, as set forth below, I, I don't know who I is, but it's obviously not me. I find that because Dartmouth has the right to control the work performed by the men's varsity basketball team and because the players perform that work in exchange for compensation, the petition for basketball players are employees within the meaning of the act. Additionally, I find that asserting jurisdiction would not create instability in labor relations. Accordingly, I shall direct an election in the petitioned for unit. That's a lot of legal yeah. jambalaya that we just went through. Basically, it means they're siding with the players and that they should be considered employees of the university. Just initial thoughts. I mean, it's not a crazy thing to say. It's not when you actually get into the nitty gritty of like what it entails to be an employee, quote unquote. It's not ridiculous at all. To be honest, like not to get on the NIL like tangent, <clears throat> but it makes more sense than players receiving NIL money as well. You think so? Really? Because think about it. So you're already getting compensated for playing a college sport in most cases because you're getting a scholarship. Especially at Division One, it's not – like people think it's just paying – some people think it's just paying for books and tuition whatever. These people are getting – they're getting money outside of that. This is before NIL, before anything. You get extra stipends and and those kind of things. exactly. You don't – you are not really paying a dime for your time being wherever you're at. Yeah, unless you're an idiot. Yeah. Or sometimes housing can be a kind of an interesting yeah, deal, but you know. If you can, fi- yeah. Most people are p- pretty close to you're not paying a dime. Most, for sure. I mean, I think there's an <clears throat> argument there. You're working for the university, and you have to follow their rules, right? Mm-hmm. And you're doing something for them, and you're getting compensated for it. Yep. Because a scholarship is still compensation. It is, and it's money. Like it's not like compensation in the form of X, Y, or Z. Like this is cash that you're giving them. It's not, you know what yeah, I mean. Like yeah, 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 yeah. What that cash is going towards, whether it be tuition, books, housing, whatever it is, it's still money. It's still cash being exchanged, you know, through hands, and it, it's just very interesting. So this, this National Labor Relations Board regional director on Monday ordered a union election for the men's basketball players. So now they can again. We should say with a grain of salt, like Dartmouth is expected to appeal this ruling and probably with a lot more force and with the best lawyer or whatever they can find. Which and I'm sure might... they can find some real <laughs> damn good <laughs> lawyers. <Dartmouth. laughs> but, you know, this could all be just gone tomorrow. It could be an afterthought and nobody speaks about it ever again. Exactly. I, it could be like game changing in the NCAA realm. It'll of, be one or the other. It's going to yeah. vanish or it's going to be something you study in a class in like 15, 20 years. Exactly. Yeah. All those like big time cases. Yeah. Like that's, it's, it's wild. So, um, reading through here and talking about how this could really reshape the industry. It's just, it's very interesting. This, I this right like, here, Michael Sue, I'm, uh, I'm hopefully pronouncing that correctly. He says he's the co-founder of the college basketball players association, the CBPA. Oh, wow. And he said, it's a positive step. It is one further step. He filed a separate unfair labor practice complaint with the NLRB uh, against the Ivy League. Huh. So that's how this all comes about is they're saying they're, <coughs> there's unfair workplace practices being incorporated because this hasn't been treated as a workplace for so long and maybe it should be. This is interesting. 
how what kind of regulations would that potentially part bring of me sports? is also yeah like what regulate what <clears throat> do they what are they what is Dartmouth basketball trying to gain out of this like yeah. what yeah because how on one are you really being traded unfairly because there are plenty of regulations and rules within the NCAA yep. already. Now, the thing is, though, because they're an Ivy League institution, the Ivy League scholarships are different than your this typical... Is this is true. Like, FBS, FCS models. Like, FBS... I, I, I use football because I just know those examples. An FBS football team is like, 83 to 85, like, yeah, full-ride yeah, yeah. scholarships. FCS has 65, and, you know, you go down the list... Ivy League operates differently, and I think it's a little bit... I don't know the exact kind of... How it works. Yeah, yeah I don't think they really do athletic scholarships like the other NCAA schools. True. This is true. So that know. could a- be the basis of where this is coming from, is that we are performing on the same... Technically, the same level. We're an FCS institution performing on the same level with the other FCS schools that are giving out full-ride athletic scholarships to their student-athletes. And athletes. if you think, of, well, basketball, they're just with everybody else. Yeah, there's no FCS, right? Yeah. It's just Division like One. They, like there's That's always crazy. a March Madness. In March Madness, there's always an Ivy League team. So Man. once in a while, there's two. Hasn't been that in a while. So now that this starting to make potentially a little bit more sense as to why they might want to yeah. do that because they do maybe think they're being treated unfairly. Which then you have you're at Dartmouth, so maybe you should just then but, you then you have a whole another argument for Ivy League to get into football realm and things. Yeah, that they're they're not allowed to go to bowl games. Did you know? Yeah. That? You knew that, right? Yeah. Is it that, or do they opt out of like playoffs? I believe the Ivy League opts out of the national playoffs, and, but they're not allowed to go to bowl games either. Really? Yeah. That's so. So odd. that's why they always have that. Well, like the best Ivy League yeah. team plays the best <clears throat> team in Japan. Okay. Or they no, they play they play the Japan's dream team. Okay. Weird, dude. Weird. It's like college football. I think that could go into their whole argument too. Eventually, yeah. like if this gets bigger. Yep. So, and again, we'll see very quickly if it does get bigger or if it yeah. just shrinks up and disappears. Because no one will talk um, about it ever. They again. believe that Dartmouth will appeal this, just like the Northwestern case. Apparently, there was something going on before. We'll see if they can actually conduct the vote before it gets appealed uh, to the NLRB. And the question will be how long they'll wait around before they make a decision. Uh, it might actually put pressure on the entire system because you talk about the amateurism and, and the whole business model, excuse me, that the NCAA is, is built upon. Yeah, man, like you, then you talk about things. Player compensation is a big one. If they're treated as employees, how does that factor in all of the money being exchanged hands through broadcast deals and yeah. ad revenue and merchandise and ticket sales? And we've cracked the door there with name, image, and likeness. It's just going to like name, image, like the merchandise and those kind of things. What about all the other money that changes hands in college athletics that the athletes don't get to see? And I always crack the door there, and we've seen how that's been very interesting in the last you know couple months. Uh, but then also player movement. Do you lay off workers? Do you trade? Is this yeah. a well, – how does that – what kind of dynamic does that make? Is there a transfer portal anymore? You don't transfer if you're working for the school. You put in a two-weeks notice and then pray that somebody else hires you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm proud to announce my – Commit no, I'm proud to announce that I've been hired. Yeah, by Northern Michigan University. Yeah, there, there's just so much that could that uh, could stem from this, like <clears throat> in so many conversations. Or so once again, we're the only people that are ever going to talk about it because it won't matter. And in 2014, it says an NLRB regional director also ruled that Northwestern football players were employees and ordered a union election. But when the case came before the board, the board explicitly did not decide whether the football players were employees. The reasoning was that Northwestern was the only private school that competed in the Big Ten Conference. The board stated that in such a situation, asserting jurisdiction would not promote stability in labor uh, relations due to the variety of state labor labor laws that would apply to football teams at state run institutions. Huh? A lot, a lot of legal slang, yeah. gander, gander in there. Oh man. Um, so then how does this, how does this impact college sports? Right. It would potentially usher in, you have a collective bargaining agreement for the NFL is a big one. Right, you talk about the CBA and when the, all the hoops they jump through, the players' association to get that passed. That would be something that we'd see in college. We'd have a CBA, a collective bargaining agreement between the NCAA and the student athletes, and people would have to represent at different levels. It would be almost treated as its own like legal structure. Yeah, which is odd. And then you talk about conferences, schools sharing a piece of the broadcast rights to those who are actually playing in the televised games. 
The, it could be like very. So I, again, if we're gonna set an, uh, the odds here on if this decision stands or not, I think the decision standing is probably at about plus eighteen hundred to plus two thousand, maybe I, even more. I was gonna say plus twenty five hundred. Plus twenty five, yeah. yeah. I think that's realistic. I think that's totally realistic. There's a lot of great information on uh, on three dot com, who does like a lot of recruiting and other things. I'm just where I'm getting a bunch of my info from. They do a lot of like transfer stuff too, but this is a pretty good article that uh, they put together. So, I uh, man. Yeah, because then you have the Fair Labor Standards Act that would come into play, and you have to treat them all according to certain regulations and things. It's going to be very interesting. So um, if you're listening to this, comment your opinions, your takes on this. And I'm very curious to hear what you guys have to say. And we talk about this because if this does impact the Division One level, guess what? The NCAA as a governing body has multiple levels, and it would not just affect Division One. This would be a Division Two, potentially Division Three, but they're not being paid. So how does that... See, you don't even try to think about it right now. Oh, no, dude. Because Division Two, you're still getting athletic scholarship. Division Three, you have academic, but it's a different... But it's not the same thing. Yeah. So then Division Three players would not they'd be exempt. Right? Or could they in some way? Or then do they say that they're not... But they say paid. this is unfair because of the unfair workplace. That, yeah. I'm oh, telling you, no. this could open up so many things, or again, it just might oh, dude. It might be nothing. That's crazy. Crazy. Um, so this says, a particular, just to close it out, a particular focus was on meals and hotels paid for by the college, strength conditioning sessions, mandatory practices and meetings, and the consequences of missing any of those. Uh, this guy was talking about it. He re- repeatedly used but, the phrase optional mandatory. That's something we've all heard as athletes. Optional workouts. But if you don't show up, you're going to get your ass chewed out. Like, this is a legit, you can't miss this. Yeah. I mean, if that's the bigger yeah, so argument, Ivy League, I can understand that. By the way, Ivy League institutions do uh, do not offer athletic scholarships. So that that, that, could, that makes a lot more the grounds down for down to the D3 realm yes. as well. And, well, I knew they didn't do it for football, but for some reason in my head, I thought it might have been... Yeah. Different for other sports. Agreed. But. No, I didn't I didn't know either. So very interesting. But like I said, leave your comments, your suggestions, whatever it takes crazy or not you got on this. Uh appreciate you listening in. Thank you for joining me, Trev. It's been D1R 149. 150 on the way. A couple big time guests joining me next week. Appreciate you all for tuning in. <laughs>